All right, welcome. This is the video solution set for quiz two. At least the practice, I mean, for quiz two. On this quiz, there, the topics include domain, range, limits, continuity, squeeze theorem, and intermediate value theorem. And on your quiz two, you'll have squeeze theorem or intermediate value theorem. You'll only have one of those. Both topics, or all the topics here, rather, are on the midterm. Okay, so the first question asks us to determine the domain of the arc sine of negative 1 plus ln of x. I'm going to start by making a statement about the domain of the arc sine function. Arc sine of x has domain negative 1, comma 1. That domain of arc sine comes from the range of the sine function. So what this means is we need the argument of the arcsine function to be between negative 1 and 1. So thus, we need negative 1 less than or equal to negative 1 plus the ln of x less than or equal to 1. The argument, the result has to be in between negative 1 and 1 for whatever x is. Okay, next step is I'm going to isolate for x. Okay, so I'm going to add 1 to all three sides. So we get 0 less than or equal to 1 of x less than or equal to 2. Then I'm going to exponentiate, exponentiate on base e. Because x is currently trapped in a log function of the base of e. So if we exponentiate the base e, we can use cancellation law to get it out. So e to the power of 0 is less than or equal to e to the ln of x is less than or equal to e to the 2. Cancellation law. Okay, and now use the fact that any that a non-zero number to the 0 is 1. So 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to e squared. Thus, the domain of allowed x values is from 1 to e squared. Any number in between those two numbers is something we can plug into the function for x. And anything outside of that, we can't plug in. It'll break the function. All right, question two. We're asked to define the range of a function. So for the range, I'm going to start by making a statement of the range of cosine of x. Cosine is between negative 1 and 1. And what I want to do is I want to build the function that's there. So we're going to build f of x. We're going to manipulate the middle and make sure when we manipulate the middle, we also manipulate the other pieces of the inequality so that in the middle we construct the function f of x. And then whatever we end up with on the left and right side of that inequality will be the, the values f of x can take, which would be the range. All right, so first, let's see. I'm going to multiply by 7. So negative 7 less than or equal to 7 times the cosine of x less than or equal to 7. Then I'm going to exponentiate. I'm going to use base e because that's what our function has. So e to the negative 7 less than or equal to e to the 7 cosine of x less than or equal to e to the positive 7. Next, I'm going to multiply by 4. Okay. So 4e to the negative 7 less than or equal to 4e to the 7 cos x less than or equal to 4e to the positive 7. Now we almost have the function in the middle there. We just need to add 3 to all the sides. Now plus 3 to everything. And we're going to get 3 plus 4e to the negative 7 less than or equal to 3 plus 4e 
So 7 times the cosine of x less than or equal to 3 plus 4e to the positive 7. Thus, our range is 3 plus 4e to the negative 7. That's as small as it can be, and as large as it can be is 3 plus 4e to the 7. Those are that that describes the list of potential y values that the function can take. The third question, part A, asks us to take a limit as x approaches 2 of a ratio. Okay, so we're taking a limit as x approaches 2 of that ratio. Let's see. All right. Now, if we try just to plug in 2, let's see what happens. We're going to get 6 minus the square root of 32 plus 4 over 2 minus 2. So 6 minus the root of 36 over 0. 6 minus 6 over 0. So 0 over 0. This is an indeterminate form. All right. Let's see what we can do with this. Indeterminate forms, by the way, you can never stop at 0 over 0. It's never the answer. There's a few tricks we can try. Often we try factoring first, but this is not a very nice expression to try to factor. So instead, I'm going to do what's called conjugation or, or rationalizing. I'm going, to, I'm going to use a trick that essentially moves the root from the top of the expression to the bottom or vice versa. It's a method that allows you to change where the root is. And in changing where the root is, sometimes you make other changes too. Well, let's see what happens. So here's how it works. I'm going to take the expression and I'm going to multiply it by 1. Because multiplying by 1 won't change anything, it won't change the value of the limit. I'm going to use a particular form of 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the same thing. As long as it's the same top and bottom, then I'm multiplying by 1. And the thing I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to use 6 plus the square root of 32 plus x squared for both components there. Okay, so all I did is I took the expression that had the root in it and the original limit, and I duplicated it top and bottom, but I changed the minus sign to a plus sign. Okay, the next step, I'm going to FOIL. I'm only going to FOIL the top in this case, not because it's the top. I'm going to FOIL the top because both pieces of the top involve a root. So limit x approaches 2. And then we have first times first, 6 times 6, so 36. And then we have... 6 times negative root, so negative 6 times the root of 32 plus x squared, and we have then a, a positive 6 times the root of 32 plus x squared, and then we have the root times the root. Roots cancel, so we have minus 32 plus x squared, making sure that both pieces get subtracted. And then the bottom we have x minus 2. Don't fall on the bottom. You'll, you'll ruin what happens. 32 plus x squared. Okay. Well, something good, something else good happens. We have the cross terms cancelling. The, the same magnitude but opposite signs. Okay. Next step. I'm going to simplify by collecting like terms over 36 and a minus 32, that's going to give you a 4 on top. And then subtract x squared. That minus sign hits both pieces in the bracket on the right there. On the bottom, x minus 2 times 6 plus the square root of 32 plus x squared. And we're not quite done yet. If we plug in 2, we still have 0 over 0. We still have to do a, a factor step. I'm going to factor. 4 minus x squared is equal to a difference of squares. It's equal to 2 minus x times 2 plus x. Now, I'm thinking ahead. 
making one move ahead. If I plug that in right now, I'm going to have a, a 2 minus x upstairs and an x minus 2 downstairs. So here's the trick I'm going to use. I'm going to common factor a negative sign out of that first bracket. Because if you multiply that negative back in, you're going to get negative x plus 2, which is the same thing as 2 minus x. Just the order of addition doesn't, doesn't matter. So that's my, my thing I'm going to replace the 4 minus x squared with. Now we'll, we'll finally, after doing that, we'll be able to cancel the parts we're making that 0 over 0. x minus 2 times 6 plus the square root term, so 32 plus x squared. Okay, I'm going to cancel those two. x minus 2 cancels x minus 2. And then we can take the limit of what's left. Okay, so now I'm going to plug in 2. So we get negative 2 plus 2 divided by 6 plus the square root of 32 plus 4. So we get negative 4 over 6 plus 6, square root of 36. So negative 4 over 12, we get negative 1 third. Definitely a tough question. Okay, part B for question three, another limit. Limit is x approaches pi from the right of e to the power of the cotan of x. So I'm going to break this down into pieces. First, I'm going to find out what happens to cotan of x when x approaches pi. So limit x approaches pi from the right of the cotan of x. We'll do that limit first, and whatever we answer we get for that, we'll plug that in to the, to the, um, as the exponent on base e. Okay, well... I don't know what that is. I don't know my my reciprocal trig functions that well, so I'm going to convert my cotan into a cosine of x over a sine of x. Okay, and then what's going to happen if I plug in pi there? I'm going to get cosine of pi plus over sine of pi plus. All right, so cosine of pi is negative 1. Sine of pi from the right. So I'm going to draw my cast rule. Help me out here. C, A, S, T. I'm going to label my angles. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. Pi plus is like 181 degrees. It's a little bit larger than pi. That puts it inside the t quadrant. And inside the t quadrant, the sine function is negative. Now, sine of pi is equal to zero, but sine of pi plus is going to be equal to zero minus because Again, pi plus is in the t quadrant, and the sine of an angle in t quadrant is, is negative. Now, this is not standard notation. I'm going to write this as a zero minus there. I, and then look at what we have. We have a negative one over zero minus. A negative over negative is going to be a positive. So we're going to have a positive answer. One divided by a tiny, tiny number is infinity. Okay, so that's the result that we get for this part of the calculation, limit as x approaches pi plus of the cotan of x is positive infinity. Okay, so we have the limit oh, equals e to the infinity. Equals infinity. So option D. Give me one second. Make sure I get save on this. Save on the video. Okay. 
Okay, next question, question four. In question four, we're asked to determine the value of b that makes a function continuous for all x. The definition of continuity is the starting point for this type of question. Definition of continuity at a point. So if f of x is continuous at x equals negative 1, which is the point of interest here, so there's a, as a little comment, the ln of b plus x squared will be continuous for all x as long as b is um, as long as b is a positive number. Because we won't have a ln of 0 if, we, if b is a positive number. And then 12x, or uh, 10x minus 12 over x, that's going to be continuous as long as we don't have the possibility that x is 0. And that piece of the piecewise function is only valid for x less than negative 1. So more negative than negative 1, which excludes 0. So the only point where this function could have a discontinuity is the point where the piecewise function switches its behavior. So I'm interested in x equals negative 1 for that reason, and we don't need to think about the other, the other coordinates, knowing that log is continuous, unless we're plugging 0 into it, and knowing that the reciprocal 12 over x is continuous except that x is equal to 0, and 10x polynomial is always continuous. Okay, definition of continuity x is equal to negative 1 is this, is that we need the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x to equal f of 1. Now this first piece, this limit being equal to f of 1, or not f of 1, f of minus 1, my apologies, negative 1, that limit being equal to something, well it can't be equal to anything if it doesn't exist, so we need this to exist, we need limit x approaches negative 1 from the left of f of x to equal the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right of f of x to equal f of negative 1. So this is an alternative statement of continuity that incorporates the left and right limits. This is also the one I show in the notes. Okay, limit from the left. From left of negative 1 means less than negative 1. So that means the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the piece of the function that corresponds to x values that are less than negative 1, which is in, in this case is the bottom function, 10x minus 12 over x. switch to a new color. Okay, now I'm going to plug in negative 1 for x. We're going to get 10 times negative 1 minus 12 over negative 1 and simplify negative 10 plus 12. We get 2. So that's about the left limit, 2. Now I'll do the right limit. From the right, means larger than negative 1. So limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right is equal to limit as x approaches negative 1. And now I select the piece of the piecewise function that comes from the right-hand side. So for x, x values larger than negative 1, so ln of b plus x squared. Is the function. Now I'm going to replace x by negative 1, so I get the ln of b plus negative 1 squared, which is b plus 1. Okay, so I get oh, ln of b plus 1 here. And then f of negative 1, because of the inequality sign underneath there, I've already calculated that. That was the same thing as the value of the limit from the on the left, so that's going to be oh, that's going to be two. Now 
Now, it's not necessary to write the equals 2 twice. 2 is equal to 2. I'm just going to focus on those last two, the, the last two pieces of the inequality. So the ln of b plus 1 is equal to 2. We can exponentiate. So e to the ln of b plus 1 is equal to e squared. Use a cancellation law. So we have b plus 1 is equal to e squared. And finally, we can solve for b. b is equal to e squared minus 1. I mentioned earlier that that top part of the piecewise function, the ln of b plus x squared, is going to be continuous for x, for all x, as long as b is positive. And here we, we get the result e squared minus 1. Now e is around 2.7, so 2.7 squared minus 1, that's definitely positive. So we're good. If this answer turned out to be a negative number, then we would have a very different answer. We would have to make a statement about the domain for which the function is defined. Anyways, that would not that would never happen. So don't worry about that. All right. Uh, there's two types of problems that you can have for question five. For one type, it is a problem that requires you to use the intermediate value theorem, which is this one shown here. And the other type is a problem that requires you to, to use the squeeze theorem, which is this type of problem here. And go through both. So the first question, true, false. The curves f of x equals x minus e times the ln of x plus 1 and g of x is 1 half plus the cos of pi x over e. Those curves intersect between x is equal to 0 and x is equal to e. All right, so first statement is f of x intersects g of x means the functions equal each other. It means f of x equals g of x or some x. Thus, f of x minus g of x equals 0 for some x, just subtracting g of x from both sides. Okay, I'm going to let h of x equal f of x minus g of x. I'm going to try to use IVT to show h of x equals 0 has a solution inside the interval 0 comma e. I want to make a statement that this function is continuous for all x greater than negative 1. So I'm making that statement because the, the first of all, the trig function, the 1 half plus the cos of pi x over e, that's continuous for all x, but the log function x times the ln of x plus 1, that function, the ln of x plus 1 part, if you plug in an argument into a log function that is less than 0 or 0, then the log function is undefined. It has a, a discontinuity of the type of, like a, a, a vertical, a vertical asymptote. So as long as we make sure that x plus 1 is greater than 0, then we have a continuous function x plus 1 is greater than 0 means that x must be larger than negative 1. What's important about that is that our, our interval of interest is larger than negative 1. So we're not, in, we're not examining this function in a domain outside of its 
area of continuity. It's continuous between 0 and E. Okay. And we're going to use IBT because it's continuous, since H of X is continuous inside the interval from 0 to E. The function is not continuous in the interval of interest. IVT cannot be used. Okay, so let's check h of zero. So h is f minus g. So first I'll construct h of x explicitly. h of x is equal to x minus e times the log of x plus one minus one half minus cos of pi x over e. Now let's check h of zero. Okay, to the left end point, so we have zero minus e times the log of zero plus one, so the log of one, minus one half minus the cos of zero, pi times zero over e is just zero. Log of one is zero. Cos of zero is just one. So 0 minus 3 over 2, we get something negative. Okay, next, h of e. Change colors, hold on. h of e, plug e in, we're going to have e minus e times the ln of e plus 1 minus a half minus the cosine of pi. E over E cancels, give you a 1. So we just have a pi left. 0 times the ln of E plus 1 minus a half minus negative 1. Cos of pi is negative 1. So we have 0 minus a half plus 1. We get 1 half, which is positive. And we can make our conclusion. Thus, by the intermediate value theorem, h of x equals zero has a solution inside the interval from zero to e. So highlighting the important parts, one of our evaluations, or one of the endpoints must be positive, the other one must be negative. So we, we have that, one is plus, one is minus. We need to have the function to be continuous inside, and then at some point, somewhere inside your solution, you have to say intermediate value theorem. That's what gives us the ability to put all this together and make a conclusion. Okay, last question, true or false? The limit as x approaches 0 plus of the tan of x times e to the cos of 1 over x is equal to 0. So this one I'm going to try the squeeze theorem. For the squeeze theorem, we know that cosine of theta is always between negative 1 and 1, just like sine of theta for any theta, including a theta that looks really weird, like 1 over x. doesn't matter what you plug into the cosine function. Cos of a smiley face is between negative 1 and 1. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build the f of x, the function we're taking in the limit of, in the middle. So I'll first exponentiate. Then I'm going to multiply by tan of x. Okay. And a little note. Tan of x is positive in the A quadrant. 
where 0 plus is. So an angle of 1 degree is in the, the, in the A quadrant. So coat tan is positive there. I mentioned that because when we multiplied all these pieces by the tan, tan of x, we're multiplying by a positive quantity. So we don't need to flip the inequality signs. There's no risk of having to do that. Next step is I'm going to take the limit of all the sides. Take limits. Each piece, we're going to take the limit as x approaches 0 plus. Oh, and the last question, I forgot to say it's true. Oops, so I'll circle that, true. All right, next, take the limit as x approaches 0 plus. of tan of x over e less than or equal to limit x approaches 0 plus of tan of x times e the cos of 1 over x less than or equal to the limit x approaches 0 plus of e times the tan of x. Okay, in the next line, I'm going to use the fact that the tan of zero is equal to zero. It'd be a zero plus if we're going from the right, a zero minus if we're coming from the left, but it won't matter. Okay, so we're gonna have a zero over e for that limit. In the middle, we can't take that limit, that's why we're doing this. Cos of one over zero is undefined. And then we have e times 0 on the right. So 0 less than or equal to something. Less than or equal to 0. Thus, by the squeeze theorem, really important you have to say that you have to say by the squeeze theorem limit as x approaches 0 plus of tan of x times e to the cos of 1 over x equals 0 so this is true as well if we got a different answer or if we found that we couldn't use the squeeze theorem if we found that that quantity in the middle there was not sandwiched between two outcomes that were the same let's say it was one less than or equal to the middle thing less than or equal to seven but we can't state that the answer is equal to the average of one and seven or one or seven we can't make any statement at all about the value of the limit so we would say i cannot draw a conclusion i can't say if it's true or false using that method we'd have to try something else the squeeze theorem wouldn't work in that case okay and that's it